Well, thank you very much, Janet. Um, look, it's a little bit daunting following a presentation like that that uh, Margaret has just delivered. I seem to be the, on the receiving end of a, uh, following very good presentations with much less time than what I anticipated I'd have. It would be lovely to spend a couple of days with you, uh, like Paula said yesterday, just talking about some of the concepts I'd like to tease apart, but you're going to have to strap on your seatbelt for a very quick overview of, of humanising the process of supporting services and communities to move towards more integrated service models. The, the topic I was given by the conference presenters was uh, children, uh, no, sorry, developing integrated child and family centres, how easy. Now, not the words I would choose, but I'm going to try to respond to that question. I come from uh, the most beautiful part of Australia, I'm sure you'd all agree. Uh, a stunning little place where uh, you wake up to the sound of frogs in the pond rather than trains whistling at five this morning. Um, now, we have a population of 500,000 people, which is about the size of Paran in Melbourne. Um, and that allows us to have much closer proximity and, and ready access to senior bureaucrats and politicians to enable us to influence the way they're thinking and the types of policies they're developing. Across Tasmania, um, the, the, the state government has invested uh, about $67 million in the rollout of up to 30 child and family centres. Um, and the official word from the Premier's minute is to fundamentally re-engineer early childhood services in the child and family centre communities. Now, if you think about those words, fundamentally re-engineer the way services are delivered, we're talking about something dramatically different. We have a lot of talk across Australia and across the Western world in regards to doing things differently for the benefit of children. A lot of talk about change. Uh, a lot of talk about key words like collaboration and integration, but as Margaret points out, do we really know what we're talking about? Have we pulled apart those, those words together with community and come to a shared understanding, a common language in regards to where are we heading? The danger is that we end up having a new look and the same old tired services. The danger is that we focus on this word centre, child and family centre, that Tasmania and South Australia has adopted and forget that really the hard bit of work isn't building a new building or doing a refurb, it's actually coming up with agreement across services as to how we're going to do something fundamentally different because what we've done in the past hasn't worked well for too many children. So this notion of change, it's, it's quite a confronting one. I, I, my experience is here in Australia we're not very good at change. We're a little bit frightened of it. And I'm tired of sitting in facilitated workshops in the early childhood arena talking about the importance of doing things differently for fathers with people sitting in the room with their arms crossed saying it won't work, too hard, can't do it. They're all over the place. These people have really tight mouths. They don't like change. And they want to trip us up. And if you are an animator of change, if you're an ambassador for change, you become their target because you're going to be asking them to do something fundamentally different. So let's stop thinking about centre as key to the name of this integrated space, but let's start thinking about the child and family community. We're not talking about a building. We're talking about an agreement across a geographical area as to how we are going to do something amazing for children, because there's a child. We've heard this morning about uh, Bromfen Brenner's ecological model and the power of that theory. We must start collectively, not just the service providers in a community where a child and family centre has been appointed by the, by the bureaucracy. We must start with families and service providers collectively sitting together and agreeing that we are doing this because there's a child. And because that child deserves nothing less than for us to move mountains to make sure that children no longer are fronting up to school with learning delays, speech delays, and other impediments that are characteristic of our lack of ability as services to engage effectively with them. I have the great privilege um, every couple of years to spend time in a village in northern Italy that my wife comes from. Um, and we were there just a few weeks ago with our kids. 
And we've brought back with us uh, my wife's 19-year-old cousin uh, because she was a bit of a loose end. She'd finished her studies and she was starting to uh, wonder what she's going to do. And we said, well, look, why don't you come to Australia with us? And so she's come down. She, she's never travelled further than 100 kilometres from the village. Uh, but she got on a plane and she came out here with us. And driving around Hobart with her, uh, she's looking for work. In fact, she's just got some, a bit of work in a childcare centre. Uh, when she first came across the concept about three weeks ago of a childcare centre, she said, what is it? I said, what's where children are dropped off and looked after? But why? Why would you do this? Because in her community, Nonna looks after the kids, or, or the kids go out onto the farm with mum and dad, or, or mum's with the kids. There's no such thing as a chugger centre. What's that building there? That's an old person's home. Oh, what is that? That's where old people go when uh, they get old and they need to be cared. Oh, Nonna lives upstairs. We look after her. So the community that we're trying to uh, redesign and redevelop artificially here in Australia is what she comes from where local information is disseminated by the elders, uh, where her 25-year-old cousin Max, when, well, several years ago before I had children when I was there, my first visit there, Massimo, who is the same age as me, uh, listened to the bells of the village, turned round in the seat of the tractor and said to me, Bambina! And I thought, what the hell is he talking about? <laughs> when we got back to the house, I asked my wife, can you ask uh, Max what was he talking about? And he said, oh, the bells rang to tell me that a baby girl was born this morning to the village. And I said, yeah, why does he want to know that? Is he the dad? And, <laughs> and he looked at me like I was from another planet. And he said, the bells rang to remind me that I have a renewed parenting responsibility to this village. Now, here's a man who didn't have children of his own. But it was so intrinsically embedded in his way of being that the bells rang to tell him a baby girl the sixth of the child was even told by the bells. So when he's walking down the street in a few days' time and he bumps into Manuela and Antonio, who've just had the baby, he has a duty to stop them, to compliment them on the birth of their baby and to say, is there anything I can do to support you? Because he is now a parent again in that village. When I try to... Uh, we, one of the things I'm, I'm, I have the responsibility of doing on behalf of the Centre for Community Child Health is contract, contracted out to the Tasmanian State Government to implement a learning and development strategy across the child and family communities. Um, and it's a, quite a complex task, as you can imagine. My colleague... Suzanne Purden and I, uh, our, our positions are funded by a little philanthropic trust called the Tasmanian Early Years Foundation, chaired by Dr Sue Jenkins, which gives us some independence. And it allows us to sit alongside the bureaucracy that's charged with the responsibility of rolling out these child and family centres and to nudge and to question, why are you doing that? Why are you doing it that way? Now this diagram is my best crack at coming up with a very simplistic explanation as to what is the journey? Where are we heading? Now, if you have a look here, typically in Australian communities, and I have the privilege of getting around quite regularly to different communities, um, uh, are operating services in this way, with the child and family represented by the green dot there, and our services being these largely, often, operating in isolation from each other, where we're requiring the parent to be quite articulate, confident, mobile, to access our services. We move towards, uh, along the continuum, towards co-location, where some of those services may actually benefit from being in the same facility or same building, but largely, often, still working in silos and separate from each other. Uh, this notion of collaboration, uh, whereby we are actually making a determined effort to truly work more closely together to make the, for the ease of the family and the child and to ensure that child health and wellbeing is right at the top of the agenda. But ultimately, when we talk about integration, my understanding of that, it would be really interesting if we had the time to have a facilitated conversation around what is integration? Because even in this room, with all these wonderful people, we're going to hear people saying things from 
oh, it's when we sit together in the same building, right through to others saying, well, actually, it's characterised by shared budgets, shared philosophy, shared culture, shared understanding, uh, 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 common assessment forms, etc., 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 morphing into one, go one governance entity whereby that we no longer put our organisation and my title and my pay and my this and my that at the top of the agenda. We put the child at the top of the agenda. And we say we will do anything to ensure that child is safe and happy and comfortable. And we'll do anything to make sure their family is socially connected because there's a child. Now, the Centre for Community Child Health that I work with uh, has developed over several years. Uh, some of this work is informed by the thinking of Dr. Tim Moore, who's like our thinker in residence, um, a, a, a framework that we call platforms. Now, you can find out more about platforms by Googling the Centre for Community Child Health um, platforms, uh, but really it's a stepwise process of assisting communities to start thinking about how might we redesign service delivery in order to better benefit the child and the family. And as Margaret pointed out this morning, it needs to start with developing a shared vision. Now my task is to assist, or part of my task, is to assist the communities in Tasmania that are grappling with how to do this, to not allow themselves to fall into the trap of being content with just getting services together to do this. If I turn up to communities where I'm going to facilitate a helpful or useful process or conversation in regards to what needs to change and it's just service providers, I just say forget it. We're not going to continue. We are aiming for at least 50% representation of non-paid community members around the table. And that comes with a whole lot of other issues. What do we do about childcare? Can we facilitate a useful meeting with children running around the room, etc., etc., etc.? Well, the answer is yes, you can. Do we go in with a clipboard and do we go in with a data projector? No, we don't. We're not the experts, we're not going there to teach, we're not going there to tell people how to do things. My task as a facilitator is to facilitate a helpful and useful process by which the knowledge in the room is brought out and we collectively come up with what we would have done on the overheads or the slides. But the knowledge has actually been elicited from the people sitting in the room, including the mums and dads. Sorry. <laughs> so what am I talking about? I'm talking about sharing, sharing power. You know, if you think about the way we traditionally provide services, the, the expert, the service provider, has an inordinate amount of power in that relationship. And that power, believe it or not, can be really unhelpful for us, for the child, and for the parent. Here's a saying, where power meets power, there you have aggression. You think about two forces going to war, aggression. Where power meets vulnerability, there you have oppression. But where vulnerability meets vulnerability, that's where you're going to find intimacy. And it's in this intimacy that we're going to encounter opportunities for doing things differently, opportunities for change. Now, given the great power we have as service providers when we encounter families that are disadvantaged or suffering, how are we going to backpedal away from that power to find a level playing field because that's where we're going to find opportunities of intimacy and opportunities for change. So the ecological model that Margaret was talking about by Bronfenbrenner uh, certainly plants the child firmly at the centre and asks us to think about all the different contexts that influence the health and well-being of that child. We need to collectively start with saying the child is firmly at the centre. Funnily enough, Suzanne, who works with me, was at a community recently and starting off with this visioning statement exercise, and they were talking about putting the child at the centre, putting the child at the centre, put the child at the centre, and one of the mums eventually went, I'm tired of talking about putting the child at the centre. I want to be at the centre too. She was talking about the building, the centre, whereas we were, she said, I don't want to drop my children off at a centre. Uh, so we have to be really careful about the words we use and making sure that people in the room have the same understanding. We need to focus in a big way on me the worker, you the worker. Who is this person? And what are their characteristics? Are they empathic? Are we genuine? Are we humble? And are we quietly enthusiastic? Now, I think, uh, I often say this, one of the greatest 
learning moments for me in my professional life has been doing the, the Hilton Davis's uh, and Crispin Day's Family Partnership Foundation course. It opened the doors for me to understanding a whole lot more about myself that I'd never even stopped to consider. That in fact everything I do and say has an effect on the people I encounter and work alongside. And how can I switch myself on to that reflection of helpfulness in order to find ways of doing things differently? I'm cutting into your morning tea time. Do you want me to stop? Okay. Okay. Can we say to families we work with, I will focus on your strengths, what you do well. Can I say to families, I believe you can change if necessary. Can I say to them, I will always be honest with you. Now that is going to demand of me that I don't go into my staff room and badmouth you. One of the reasons I got out of teaching was I was tired of children's reputations and possible opportunities in the future being tarnished in the staff room before the grade two teacher even clapped eyes on him. Is that respect? No, it's not. We don't have to be geniuses to work that out. But I will always be honest with you demands that I will always be honest with you, even when it's tough to be honest with you. I view myself as no more important than you. Can I say this to families in reflection? I, will all, I view myself as no more important than you, and I am genuinely interested in you. If I can't say these things, I would suggest we need to stop and have a really hard think about what are we doing. Because if I can't say these things quite genuinely to families or on, on reflection in my head, well then perhaps I might be missing something really special. A shared understanding that Margaret talked about. Um, do we, as a group, if you imagine a group of community members and service providers coming excitedly together to do something new and different, which involves part of, you know, what. Well, partly includes building a new centre or refurbishment, but it actually includes a, a design of a new service delivery model across this geographical location. Do we stop in those meetings every time and honour the importance of relationship development? Do we stop and think, gee, there's new people in the room. Should we backtrack and actually spend time with them, helping them understand where we've come from? Or do we just ride roughshod over that and expect that they catch up in their own time and wonder why they never come back again? Do we constantly check we are talking the same language? Is everything shared with and driven by the community, really? Or are we happy to just impose our own solutions from bureaucratic spaces that parents aren't invited into? Do we open this process up to reflective critique? Now there's Massimo I was talking about before. We were there a few weeks ago. He's a dairy farmer. Now a litmus test, I reckon, for these kind of integrated centres is to ask ourselves, who buys the milk? If you look in the fridge of most interdisciplinary services, you will see Doreen's milk, don't touch, child health, <laughs> kindergarten, Tom's lunch, keep away. Now, can we collectively, to start off with, say, hey, who buys the milk here? So that when Max the farmer comes in to see his baby, or to work with us, and we say, grab yourself a coffee, he doesn't open the fringe and thinks, crikey, can I touch any of this? <laughs> it does everything and everyone model the model. Do our bureaucratic and political processes model a helpful process? This is above the sink in my workplace in the Department of Health and Human Services in Hobart. Now, if I have a parent come to visit me and they've navigated their way through the security cameras and the sliding door that won't open, and I say, do you want a coffee, and they see that, is it helpful? Perhaps not. Perhaps not. Have we stopped to think about the intricacies of modelling something helpful and useful for families? Because there's a child, and because we want you to come back, and because we value you, and because we respect you. Are we... Are we animators of change? Are we prepared to take occasional risks? Because we have so many policies and protocols, mostly designed out of political correctness for the convenience of you and your services, including hours of operation, that aren't in the best interest of children. So are we prepared to go out on a limb because there's a child? 
Developing integrated child and family centres, it's not easy. And it's going to be hard. And it's going to be complex. And we're going to have to compromise. And there will be moments of argument. There will be anxiety. But imagine the difference of what could happen for children if we got it right. Thank you.